All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to another iteration of uh, the One Pass thematic series on uh, the mathematics of thin structures. Uh, today, we're pleased to have with us uh, Jean Francois, Francois uh, Babajian from uh, Paris uh, Sacré. Uh, and as you can see, he'll be talking to us about reduced models for linearly elastic thin films, allowing for some stuff uh, that he'll <laughs> tell us about. Um, Jean Francois. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Say, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this uh, nice series of, uh, of talks. So I'm going to speak about uh, a joint work uh, in collaboration with uh, several people. So uh, the mathematical part of this work was done in collaboration with uh, Duvan and Nao. Uh, and there is also a modeling and uh, numerical parts of which I'm not responsible but which was still done in the same project in collaboration with Blaise Bourdin, Andres Leon Baldelli, and Corrado Maurini. Uh, so uh, in this uh, problem, we were interested actually, as the title says, about reduced models in the framework of, uh, no, of uh, linear elasticity. So contrary to, to previous talks uh, in this series of seminars, which whether address uh, non-linear elasticity. So here I'm going to speak about linear elasticity. Uh, of thin films, of course, because this is the topic of the, of the talks. And uh, I'm going to, to present, uh, use the derivation of a reduced model, which allows uh, for different crack modes, uh, going from transverse cracks to uh, planar cracks and delamination. So uh, the, the starting point was actually an observation uh, done by a colleague of us in Paris, so it's called François Jouve, that maybe some of you know. So, uh, so if you already went to Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, in Palaiso actually, so the research buildings uh, so are, num are numbered. And uh, here you can see a picture. So this is a picture of the research building 401, which I don't remember which one it is. And uh, so Francois Joux made us this observation that, so of course, this num so these numbers are actually very, uh, thin uh, film stickers, which are glued on uh, this uh, gray plate. And they are outside, you can see the sky here. And uh, as a consequence, so they are subjected to, uh, to external loading, such, are, such as, for instance, variation of temperature. And uh, with time, they experience defects. Okay, so you can see it quite, uh, quite well on this picture. And uh, these defects turn out, turn out to be cracks. So, for instance, if you focus on this uh, zero number and on the south pole of this zero number, so here is a zoom of this, uh, of this number. So you can see two different type of cracks. So they are first um, uh, transverse cracks, so here and here, which splits uh, the film into several pieces. Okay, so they are essentially one dimensional cracks. So here you observe a deformed configuration. This is the reason why uh, this is not one dimensional is because uh, but this is really something, uh, uh, if you see it in the reference configuration, it is something one dimensional. But not only uh, transverse cracks, you also observe uh, planar cracks, uh, for instance, here, uh, which comes from uh, debonding of the film from its substrate. Okay. So uh, starting from this, uh, Blaise Bourdin, Andres Leon Baldelli, Jean Jacques Marigot, and Corrado Maurini have introduced a phenomenology called two-dimensional model of a thin film bonded on a substrate to try to explain this type of uh, crack, uh, of crack uh, patterns. And, um, and then our objective, so this is the topic I'm going to speak uh, today in my talk, is how uh, to derive this type of models of, uh, uh, of two-dimensional model from three-dimensional uh, three linear elasticity by making an asymptotic analysis as a sickness and studio. So this is essentially the objective of the talk um, and uh, of uh, what we do. So I'm going to present you the, the three-dimensional model. So um, in this model, uh, we consider a system which is made of, uh, of a thin film. So I'll try to, to, um, to, to draw at the same time. So, so the thin film is, a, so this is as usual, uh, a cylinder uh, of, uh, of small thickness. So this is the film, okay, of, uh, of basis small omega. 
m of thickness epsilon. So this is the set that I call omega epsilon f, okay? And this in film is bounded on, a, on an infinite substrate through a bonding layer. So you have an infinite substrate uh, below here at the level minus epsilon, okay? And in between, you put a bonding layer that you call omega uh, epsilon, okay? So both the thin film and the substrate have a thickness epsilon. The, uh, sorry, the, the film and the bonding layer have thickness epsilon and the, the substrate is infinite and we are not going to care a lot about this, okay? And uh, so I'm going to work in the framework of linear isotropic elasticity. Uh, and uh, in uh, linear elasticity, the natural kinematic variable to consider, the unknown of the problem, is the displacement. So contrary to nonlinear elasticity, where we were rather focusing on the deformations. So here I'm going to consider displacements. So the, the displacement is a deformation minus the identity, if you wish. And uh, so I'm going to assume that this, uh, this system is subjective to external loadings, uh, which are of planar nature. So first of all, I'm going to assume that there is an, an inelastic strain acting on this, uh, on this body, uh, which can be due, for instance, to thermal leading. So this might be variation of temperature, as I was seeing in the, in the previous slide, but which will be fixed. So I'm not going to. To, to focus on coupled system with heat equations, so the, the temperature is fixed, and um, it appears in the in the energy through this uh, elastic strain. And at the same time, I'm going to assume that uh, the substrate on which the film is uh, deposited is infinitely stiff in such a way that you have no choice; the displacement must be pres prescribed in the substrate, and we call it U naught. And again, it is a planar displacement. Okay, so then we allow this body to crack. And uh, what, what, what is a crack? A crack is going to be a set gamma uh, contained in a omega uh, epsilon bar. So omega epsilon bar is the union of these three sets. Um, uh, it is a union of these three sets, the film, the bonding layer, and the substrate. But actually, since the displacement will be uh, prescribed in the substrate, actually, it will only live in the film and in the bonding layer. Okay, it will not go into the into the in the interior of the substrate, but it might go to the interface between the substrate and the bonding layer. So this will be a set, uh, uh, a surface, if you wish, in, in omega epsilon bar, um, a two-dimensional surface, and the total energy associated to a given crack gamma and to a given displacement defined outside gamma. Uh, and which which which, which is uh, equal to u naught in the substrate is going to be the sum of an elastic energy and a surface energy. So the elastic energy is computed outside the crack, okay, and uh, it is a quadratic form of the strain, the elastic strain. So E of v, which is the symmetric part of the, of the statement minus the inelastic strain because this is what you want to reach. Okay, so a quadratic form with elasticity coefficients a epsilon, which might depend on it, which will depend on epsilon. Okay, I'm going to, to be more precise later on that. Okay, so this is the elastic energy. And then uh, you must also pay the presence of cracks inside your body. And to do that, you are going to, to add a surface energy. Uh, uh, which will be the integral of some function, kappa epsilon, uh, which called the toughness, which is a material uh, constant, integrated over the crack. Okay? Uh, so this is the so-called, uh, so people are used to call this type of functional now the Griffith functional, uh, because it comes from the Griffith theory of uh, brittle fracture, which has been uh, revisited uh, several years ago by, uh, by Gilles Francfort and Jean-Jacques Marigot to put it in a variational framework. And this is actually this type of framework that I'm considering here. OK, so the first point is that um, uh, the first difficulty to, to address this type of problems is that we are considering a problem with two unknowns, V and gamma, one of which being a set. And this is, in general, quite difficult. And um, uh, so uh, the Italian school of De Giorgi 
have introduced a so-called weak formulation for this type of problems, uh, where uh, the, the crack is, um, uh, is uh, represented by the jump set of the displacement. So in, in general, the displacement might be discontinuous across the crack. So the jump set of the displacement is contained in the crack. So here, I just assume that the, the crack is exactly uh, the jump set of, of this, of the displacement. So this type of uh, of uh, of problem of um, of of uh, yes of problems turn out to be well defined in a functional space called SD for special functions of bounded deformation. So this is like uh, BV if you want. So you so except that we only require um, control on the symmetric part of the gradient in the sense of distribution instead of the full gradient. So SVD is a space of functions of vector fields whose um, distributional symmetric gradient that I call capital E of V is a measure, but not any kind of measure, a measure which has a smooth part, so a part which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue, and I call small E of V the density. So this is essentially the strain outside the crack, if the crack was smooth, okay? And uh, this type of function also uh, are also discontinuous, so they have a jump set, which is smooth enough in such a way that you can define on this normal as well as traces on both parts of the of the of, of the jump set. Okay, so when you write uh, the derivative in the sense of distributions, uh, you must account also uh, a, a kind of Dirac mass if you want on the jump set, and this Dirac mass is carried by a density which is obtained by writing essentially the 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 uh, uh, by, by integrating by parts on both sides of the, of the jump sets. Okay, so this is SBD. So just to fix ideas, think of, the, if you don't know this space, think of this space of being smooth functions outside smooth jump sets, which is almost the case. Okay. And um, so from the point of view of the asymptotic analysis, so in the previous slide, I was considering an inelastic strain and a substrate, which was appearing uh, in the energy. So from the point of view of the analysis, and thanks to the hypothesis I did, it will not be restrictive to assume that, that they vanish. So I forget about them. So it allows me to rewrite the elastic energy just as the quadratic form of, the, of E of V, and to assume that V is zero in the, in the substrate, okay? So next, I'm going to, 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 to perform an asymptotic analysis as epsilon tends to zero. And so we must uh, do some uh, scale, assume some scaling law on the on the data of the problem, which are on the one end the elasticity coefficients a epsilon, and on the other end the um, fracture coefficients, which which is k epsilon. So I'm going to assume yes. Jean François, sorry, yes. just a question. In the um, when you compute capital E, the jump in the v, yes, it could be in any direction, or is yes. it? In yes. the normal direction only. No, in no, any in, any, direction. in any direction. In any direction. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to assume that the elasticity and the and the fracture parameters are piecewise constant in the film and in the bonding layer. So in the film, I'm going to assume they are both of order one. Okay, so AF for film and kappa F for here. And in the bonding layer, I'm going to assume that the elasticity parameter scale like epsilon squared, and in the fracture parameter scale like epsilon. Okay, so this is an assumption. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the only uh, right thing to do. I'm just saying that this assumption, this scaling law, will give rise to actually the, the type of model we want to derive. Okay? But I'm not going to, to present you a, a full hierarchy of models as uh, was previously done, for instance, um, in the talk of Gilles, uh, who presented the, the various results of physical James Miller. So here, I'm just choosing one particular scaling. Okay. So I recall you also that I'm working in an isotropic, uh, uh, isotropic uh, um, uh, framework. So the elasticity parameters, A, F, and A, B, are totally uh, completely uh, characterized by so-called Lamé coefficients that are usually called lambda and f, and I call uh, uh, lambda and u, sorry. So I just write an index f for the film and b for the bonding layer. Okay, okay so now uh, that we have 
chosen this scaling law. So let us replace this in the, in the total energy and see how it, uh, it, uh, it transforms. So, uh, so the energy, the total energy is now split into two parts, a part in the film, a part in the bonding layer. And the part in the film is an, is an energy, sorry, of order, one, of order zero with respect to epsilon, if you want. Uh, there is no epsilon in front of the, of the elastic and the surface energy. And uh, for the bonding layer part, there is a, an elastic energy which scales like epsilon squared and the surface energy which scales like epsilon. This is just rewriting uh, the energy with respect to the assumption that I did. Okay. So now, uh, so we have seen this many times in the previous talks. We want to pass to the limit in epsilon. Um, and the first difficulty is that we are working on a domain which depends on epsilon. So we are going to rescale everything to formulate the problem equivalently on a fixed domain. So to do that, so in nonlinear elasticity, uh, what was explained by uh, all the previous uh, uh, participants is that we rescale the, the variable. So we replace x3 by epsilon x3 in such a way that now the new x3 belongs to a fixed set independent of epsilon. So we still do that in the framework of linear elasticity, but not only, we also need to rescale the displacement, okay? So the, the planar pla part of the displacement is untouched. So alpha, so in all my talk, alpha will be um, equal to one or two, okay? So it is an index which means one or two. So the planar part of the displacement is not touched by the, by the scaling, so just the variable here. It's just the anti-plane part of the displacement, so u3, which is rescaled with an epsilon factor, like that. So there are essentially two reasons for that. There is a bad mathematical reason, which is related to the fact that uh, so the, the, when you do this scaling, you, uh, you keep the symmetric structure of the strain by doing the, the scaling. So this is something we are going to see later. Uh, so, uh, so for the mathematical analysis, it is convenient to do that for, for this, for, from this point of view. But there is an old, another um, reason, more on mechanical nature, and which is maybe a better, uh, a better reason, is that if you perform a formal asymptotic expansion of this type of models with respect to epsilon, you'll see that at first order, the, the first meaningful model at first order is the one which involves the, um, the, planar, displacement, the, the planar displacement, which are of order one, and uh, the antiplane displacement, which are of order epsilon. Okay. But this is only formal, and to my knowledge, there, there is no uh, mathematical justification for it. Okay, so I rescale the problem. So I express now everything in terms of the new displacement u, which is defined on this rescale configuration. And, um, I, and I divide the energy by epsilon, as usual, as we have seen many times, because epsilon is the volume of, um, of the cylinder. And I call it j epsilon of u, the new energy, okay? And the new energy, again, is a sum of an energy in the film and in the bonding layer. And in the film, as well as in the bonding layer, by the way, the strain E of V is replaced, is replaced by a, a rescale strain that I call E epsilon of U, which is given by this expression. And uh, you, see, you see that this, this expression is a symmetric matrix. And we kept the symmetry structure of the strain thanks to this, uh, to this scaling, okay? So you have a planar part with scale like one, a one, um, one, three, and a two, three part which scales like one over epsilon, here and here, and a three, three part which scales like epsilon minus. Okay, so you have the same expression in the film and in the bonding layer, except that in the bonding layer you have the factor epsilon squared, and then if you do the, the change of variable in the surface energy. So uh, this is a computation that you can check if you want. Uh, so you will pay um, a determinant Jacobian, which is expressed in terms of the normal mu u to the jump set. So it is expressed in terms of this rescale normal, where in front of the third component, you put uh, one over epsilon. So this is essentially, essentially a change of variables. Okay. And then, okay, we would like to pass to the limit in this, uh, in this type of energy. This is a... Uh, the goal. So to do that, I'm going to proceed um, uh, step by step by going to the 
from the very beginning uh, to this situation. And I can just tell you uh, right now the conclusion is the conclusion is that uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we, 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 are, we were not able to conclude in this full generality, but we have partial results. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, partial results in this uh, generality, but uh, full results uh, with, with uh, additional assumptions. So the first case I would like to consider is the very uh, standard case of dimension reduction in linear elasticity. So in this part, I forget about cracks. Okay, there is no cracks anymore. There are no cracks anymore. And I forget about bonding layer. I'm just considering the film and uh, an elastic body in the film. So the elastic energy is this one, JF epsilon of U, okay? Uh, which is a quadratic form of the uh, rescale strain. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to, to uh, rewrite this expression using the, the assumption that my material is isotropic. Okay, so I express the quadratic form in terms of the Lamé coefficient, and I get this expression here. So you don't have to read it in details. Just observe that there are three different terms, a term of order one, a term of order epsilon minus two, a term of order epsilon minus four. Okay. And if you want to pass to the, so there is a first observation also, a second observation that if you uh, could keep, put together the terms uh, with the lambda f, so this one, sorry, uh, this one, this one, and this one, it is a non negative term that you can throw away. For the time being, then uh, if you look at the other terms, so the terms in factor of the diverging uh, of the diverging coefficients here and here, you you get uh, the the e alpha three and e three three uh, component of the of the strain, which are multiplied by a diverging factor. So in the limit, this term should cancel. Okay. So in the limit, we expect that. Um, e alpha three of u is equal to zero, or is almost zero in convenient topology, as well as e three three of u. Okay, so this implies. So if you assume that they are exactly equal to zero, so e three three of u is just the derivative with respect to x three of e three. So this just tells you that u three is a function just of the variable x prime of the planar variable. It's, so it is independent of x three, and if you plug this information into this, you get that u alpha, so the one and two component of u, are affine with respect to x3, with a slope which is given by the partial derivative with respect to x alpha of u3. Okay, so here I write one half minus x3 because I am considering a plate between zero and one, so the middle plate is at level one half. This is the reason why I. Well, symmetrized scenes. So these displacements are called Kirchhoff-Lov displacements. So in the framework of linear elasticity, dimension reduction gives rise to admissible limit displacements, which are of Kirch Kirchhoff-Lov type. So these types of, um, of, uh, of uh, functions. And this is a result, I think, which is due to Sarle or Sanchez Palencia, which should go back to the 70s. Which tells you, so I can reformulate this in modern language, saying that J epsilon f of u will gamma converge, in a, for instance, in L2, in the topology of L2, to um, uh, a limit uh, energy functional, which is still of a linear elasticity type. Okay. But it's not uh, two dimensional anymore in the, in the sense that the, 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 the limit um, model. Is settled on the full omega, which would be omega f, by the way. But then, if you put into so the, the Lamé coefficients are modified a little bit, okay. And if you put the information that u has to be of this form, so this energy decouples into the sum of two energies. So one which involves the planar displacement u bar here, and one which involves the antiplane displacement u three here, okay. And the first energy is actually a membrane type, type energy, which accounts for stretching effects. But the second one involves um, flexural type energy, which accounts for bending effects. So uh, the second energy here 
involve second order partial derivative and uh, formulate in terms of PDEs, it gives you the biharmonic equation uh, of plates. Okay, so this is the very beginning uh, that I wanted to still to present because everything will rest on this uh, in, the, in the sequence. And now I'm going to gradually add uh, difficulties and to add uh, uh, some um, some uh, some ingredients to to uh, little by little introduce the full model that I presented you at the beginning. Okay, so next um, in the second uh, section. I'm going to still to work in the uh, in the framework of pure elasticity. So I don't I'm not considering cracks yet, okay? But I'm going to add the bonding layer. So previously, what I just uh, what I just presented you is just what happens in pure elasticity in the film. So now I add to the film the bonding layer, but with no cracks. So I have in this case two energies, so the energy in the film and the energy in the bonding layer, which are similar, except that in the bonding layer, you have an epsilon squared factor because it was my choice of scaling, okay? And you have an additional information, which is very important, is that the displacement is prescribed in the substrate and it is given by zero, okay? So when you perform the assumption analysis with this additional assumption, so the energy in the film will give you exactly the same conclusion than in the previous case, in the sense that you should end up with at least kirchhoff loss type displacement, okay? But now, using the knowledge that the displacement must vanish in the film, and the fact that in the bonding layer, you have still a diverging factor in front of E33 of you, this will tell you that E33 is not only independent of X3, but it is actually zero. It vanishes totally, okay? So then putting this information into the planar displacement, you end up with a displacement, limit displacement, which are planar, okay? Which means that U3 is equal to zero, and the one and two components are only depending on X prime, on X1 and X2, okay? And um, so, the energy in the film will give rise to the same limit energy as before, okay? But now the bonding layer will contribute also to an additional term, okay? And this additional term will be a term which will be a cohesive term which will pay the mismatch between the displacement which is prescribed in the, in the substrate, which is zero, and the displacement which happens to be in the film, which is uh, which is U bar. So in the limit, you end up, so this is a result we got with now, which is not difficult. We, you end up with a, with a limit energy, uh, which uh, which is defined on planar displacements, not on kirchhoff plot displacement, but on planar displacements. Uh, the limit energy uh, uh, due to the, to the film is exactly an, um, a stretching type energy, a bending energy, if you want, okay? Uh, so there is not anymore the energy involving U3 because U3 is zero, okay? But there is an additional term due to the bonding layer, which is a cohesive energy, which pays the mismatch, the mismatch of displacement in between the, the, the film, which is U bar, and the bonding layer, which is, U, uh, which is zero. So if you kept U0, in the bonding layer, you would have u minus u zero squared. Okay, so this is the cohesive energy, um, um, and this is a model which is called uh, Winkler foundation, which is quite well known in the engineering uh, community. So it is a way by through this asymptotic analysis to derive um, asymptotically this type of uh, Winkler from foundation, elastic foundation. Okay. So I gave here some several references about uh, the presence of this type of cohesive energies. So, uh, so here we rigorously derive this, this, um, this uh, cohesive energy through the uh, kind of asymptotic analysis and in the framework of nonlinear elasticity. So uh, this type of model was, which was just phenomenologically uh, introduced by Batacharya Fonseca Frankfort 
was also um, uh, re, um, derived in a different way by means of Neumann sieve type problems in a work that I did, uh, for instance, with Nadia Ancini and Katerina Zetien. And there are also other uh, type of approaches due to Kubitschek, uh, Scardia Zanini, and Freddy Caroni, Kubitschek Zanini, who studied uh, similar models of uh, linear elasticity involving this type of cohesive, uh, cohesive energy. Okay, so the first part was to just consider what happens just in the film, in the case of elasticity. Now I have um, described you quickly uh, what happens when you add to the film a bonding layer and a substrate, but still in the framework of elasticity. And we have seen that the additional thing that we get is that we end up with planar limit displacements and with a cohesive energy, which pays the mismatch of displacement between the film and the substrate. Okay. So now I'm going a little bit further by uh, introducing cracks. So let's try, let's now introduce cracks. And I'm going to present you now how it's possible in the context of uh, linear elasticity to, uh, to derive a transverse cracks. So transverse cracks, I recall you that these are type of cracks which splits the body into several pieces. Okay. These are cracks which are invariant with respect to the thickness of the film. To do that, I'm just considering the film. I forget about the, the bonding layer and the substrate. I'm just considering the film. Okay. So in the film, if I allow the film to crack, I, am, I have to consider an energy, which is the sum of a, an elastic energy in the film, outside the crack, outside the jump set of you, and the surface energy, which is rescaled in this way. So I recall you that the rescaling in the surface energy gives rise to an integrant, which is this rescale normal with, with a one over epsilon factor in front of U3. Okay? So here, uh, this is just the film. Okay, so once again, uh, I rewrite this energy by expanding uh, the elastic energy and writing it in terms of the Lamé coefficients, so lambda and mu. So this is, this is exactly the same expression that in the case of elasticity, except that you need to recall that now E of U is a smooth part of the strain of the function U, which is a, a function which can be discontinued. So it is essentially the strain outside the, outside the crack. The, in terms of measures, if you want, it is the absolutely continuous part of the measure uh, E of U with respect to the Lebesgue measure. OK, <laughs> and now uh, okay, we would like to do, uh, again, an asymptotic analysis of this problem when epsilon tends to 0. So, um, so we are going to, to use a um, result uh, on this space, uh, SVD, uh, which, are, which are essentially due, due to Bellitini, Cochet, Almazo. Uh, which give us actually a compactness result in that space. Okay, so this result tells you that if you have a sequence in SVD whose energy is uniformly controlled with respect to epsilon, and if additionally you assume an L infinity bound on the displacement, which is something which might be uh, removed, then you essentially have compactness. Okay. Compactness in a suitable weak sense that I write with quotation marks because this is not uh, a true weak uh, convergence. Uh, this is a weak, uh, a convergence which is well adapted to this type of problems. Okay. And we end up with a limit function u, which is still of SBD type. Okay. So it belongs to the same space. And which here, in the particular case that we have, has an additional structure. So again, due to the fact that you have a diverging coefficients here and here, it will apply that in the limit, exactly as in the case of elasticity, this term and this term must vanish. So this is exactly what I wrote here. E i3 of u must be zero in the limit. So this limit displacement must satisfy this, this, um, this, uh, this requirement. And in addition, so now we have in addition, additionally a surface energy with again a diverging term. The diverging term is one over epsilon times the third component of the normal. 
And in the limit, this should imply that the third component of the normal to the jump set must be zero as well. OK? So limits of displacements with uniformly bounded energy must converge to displacement which satisfy these assumptions. Unfortunately, it does not give us this a, a, a priori the same structure in, than in the case of linear elasticity, which was the Kirchhoff loft structure, structure. And this is because, so U3 will again be a function independent of X3. Okay, so this was as before. The point is that U alpha, a priori, we don't know from this directly, this is not totally obvious, if we can write as an affine function of X3. And the reason is that if you look at the, the distributional str strain E alpha 3 of U, so capital, the capital letter means in the sense of distribution, this in general is not zero because there is a remaining term which involves the third component of the jump and the alpha component of the normal, which in general is not zero. So in the case of elasticity, we have Kirchhoff of displacement because this quantity is zero. We do have also the similar type of um, structure in the case of plasticity, but not here. This term is in general not zero. Okay. Fortunately, we can, uh, although limit displacement are not of Kirchhoff loft type, we can prove that they actually have the same structure outside the jump set. In the following sense, so this is a result we got we got again with Duvan and Ao. So. Again, limit displacement U must have a component U3, which is independent of X3. So it is a function defined just on the planar variable. Okay. And the planar displacement U alpha is a function which is affine with respect to X3, indeed, with a slope which is D alpha of U3. But here you have to be careful to the notation, which might maybe are not uh, very good. The alpha of X3 here doesn't mean the partial derivative of U3 with respect to X alpha. It means only the smooth part, the, the absolutely continuous part of, um, of the measure with, uh, of, uh, of um, the derivative of U3 with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So in other terms, it is the approximate uh, partial derivative of U3 with respect to the alpha which exists because we can prove that X3 is, an SBV, is, a, is a function of bounded variation, essentially. So although limit displacement are not of Kirchhoff loft type, they enjoy the same structure in the sense that U3 is independent of X3, and U alpha is uh, affine with respect to X3. And additionally, what is maybe more important is that the jump set of U is something which is uh, uh, invariant with respect to the X3 direction. So it is the Cartesian product of some um, one dimensional set with uh, the, the X3 variable. So this is, so you really end up with uh, cracks or jump sets which are invariant with respect to the X3 direction. So this is really what we mean by transverse cracks. Okay. And the limit energy is again. Uh, given by exactly the same expression than in the case of elasticity for the elastic energy, okay? Except that small e of u is intended now outside the jump set, so it is the absolutely continuous part of the measure capital U. And you have also uh, um, uh, a surface energy term which pays the area of the crack, and you can rewrite this by using uh, the, the structure of the displacement, which is written here. So again, it decouples into the sum of a membrane energy, a flexural energy here, and a surface energy, which is actually a length energy because, uh, because the surface, the, the surface cracks, the surface jump set is invariant with respect to X3. You just uh, have to, to, to measure the length of the, of the projection. So this type of result has been derived in the context of nonlinear elasticity uh, by, uh, by Brides Fonseca, Bouchite Fonseca, Leonie Mascarena. So I have also a few contributions on that, uh, on, that, on that problem in the framework of nonlinear elasticity. And I wanted to mention also uh, 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 a point 
that uh, this analysis, which uh, has been done six years ago, so it's not uh, really recent, um, was done under the assumption that the displacement are uniformly bounded in L infinity. Okay, this was uh, the reason why is that we needed to apply this result, this compactness result of Bellini Cauchy Dalmazo, which requires this type of assumption, but which was not justified. Okay, so I learned that a few months ago, um, Almi and Tasso generalized this result, uh, getting rid of this an infinity assumption. The price to pay is to work with another space than SBD, which is a space more complicated. Uh, so this is just to say that uh, this assumption can be removed at the expense of changing the, the functional framework, which becomes uh, much more difficult, actually. OK, so let me try to summarize what we did up to now. So I presented you in the first, um, in the first uh, paragraph, in the first section, just dimension reduction of a thin film in linear elasticity. OK, in the second section, I Again, in the case of pure elasticity, I added a bonding layer and a substrate. And um, we obtain in the limit a pure elasticity model, which involved the cohesive energy, which pays the mismatch of displacement between the film and the substrate. Okay. In this uh, section, in this paragraph, I have presented you a model which gives rise, so just by considering the film, which gives rise to transverse cracks. Okay. So now we arrive at the, at the final uh, result, which puts everything together, which means the film, the bonding layer, and the, the substrate, as well as the possibility of uh, fracture. OK? So as I told you uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, unfortunately, we were not able to, uh, to address the problem that I have formulated at the very beginning. Uh, because of technical reason, which I don't want to, to, to enter into the detail because it's really technical. So uh, I'm going to, to, to consider a simplified model of a thin film deposited on a substrate through a bonding layer, which allow for cracks. But the simplification from, is, is coming from the structure of the displacement. I am going to do a, some kind of anti-plane assumption on the displacement. So I'm going to assume that the displacements, so maybe the notation are not very good again, the displacement, uh, so I should put an arrow here, which is uh, usually a vector field, okay? So I'm going to assume that it is actually a scalar, it is given by a scalar function. So it is a scalar function of, um, of uh, the x1 and x3 variables oriented towards the x2 variables, okay? So if so, this is an assumption. This is what we usually call anti-plane assumption. And um, if you plug this information into the energy, the complicated, difficult, uh, the complicated uh, elastic energy, which was expressed in terms of the symmetric gradient of U, is now reduced to some kind of Dirichlet energy, so which is rescaled appropriately because of the fact that we have uh, this uh, rescaling. But this is really the integral of the gradient of u squared appropriately rescaled uh, in the film and in the bonding layer. Okay, so now the, the, the problem of passage from 3D to 2D becomes 2D1D. Okay, and it is on this simplified model that I'm uh, going to present you uh, so a gamma convergence result. So. When we consider this system made of a film on the same substrate through a bonding layer, which allow for cracks, when we pass to the limit, we actually end up with a limit model, which is actually what we expected, that is a, a limit models, model which involves so an elastic energy here. So this is the integral of u, of u, u prime squared. So this is the analogous to the, to the, elastic, to the reduced elastic energy which is computed outside the jump set of u. So limit u is one dimensional, so the jump set are just points. Okay. Then you count the number of uh, discontinuity points here. So these are the transverse cracks. So since we have a one dimensional reduced models, 
cracks are just points. Okay, so they are invariant with respect to the, to the thickness. So uh, in 2D, they are vertical intervals. And then you pay a cohesive energy integral of u squared, but as long as the displacement u is uh, below a threshold which depends on the fracture and elasticity parameter in the bonding layer. So when u is below, so when you, when you are in the complementary of that set, it is convenient to pay uh, a, a cohesive energy of u squared type. So you pay the mismatch of displacement between the bonding layer, which is zero, and the substrate and the film, which is u squared. Uh, as long as the displacement is small below this, uh, this uh, threshold. And once you, re you reach this threshold, it is more convenient to create a crack. And a crack will be a one-dimensional crack. So recall that we are in a one-dimensional model. OK? So uh, maybe I should can maybe put a, do a, do a, a picture. So we have a one-dimensional model. So this is the interval capital E, capital I. OK? So this is your plate. So your plate has um, uh, transverse cracks, which are like that. So these are the points. Uh, these are J of U, if you want. And then at some portion of, uh, of the, the mid surface, the, the mid interval, which is I, you are going to pay one dimensional cracks, which are given by this set delta. We call them delta as uh, for delamination because they are, these are delamination sets, so uh, one dimensional cracks which separate the um, which uh, brutally separate the, the film from the substrate. Okay, so these are these zones in the picture that I uh, showed you before where the film really uh, escapes from the substrate. Okay. So this is exactly uh, the type of models that uh, we wanted to derive. But of course, in this simplified setting of scalar displacement, uh, and uh, in the context of vectorial displacement, so the, uh, what I wanted to do at the beginning, so we conjecture that the right uh, limit energy should be this one. So uh, this is not really difficult to guess, because uh, you have essentially the two first terms are exactly the same ones that you obtain. So sorry, the three first terms. These are exactly the same ones that you obtain when you are just considering the dimension reduction in the film with transverse cracks. Okay, and then you add a, a, a cohesive energies, a co a cohesive energy as long as the planar displacement doesn't reach this threshold given by the same uh, parameters kappa b and mu b in the bonding layer. And then you will pay na then uh, uh, a delamination energy, which involves plan cracks this time, because this, this, this would be uh, in the case where you do 3D to 2D dimension reduction. So uh, this is just a conjecture. Unfortunately, we don't have a proof of that. Uh, we have a proof. So when you prove a gamma convergence result, you prove a lower bound and an upper bound. Okay. We have a proof of uh, the upper bound by considering this uh, sequence. So appropriately, uh, uh, where well, delta and uh, u bar are appropriately regularized, but this is possible. So if you put this sequence inside the original energy and you pass to the limit, you exactly end up, end up with this. OK, so there is no surprise for that. Then the difficulty comes from the lower bound. And uh, it comes uh, for this delamination term, actually. Uh, we do have a lower bound, but with a bad multiplicative constant. So we have a lower bound with a constant uh, one half here. Okay. So because at some point, we do a very rough uh, lower bound estimate, which is far from being, being optimal, uh, but uh, we don't know how to do, uh, how to do better. OK, <laughs> so um, I'm just going to, to conclude this. Uh, talk because I am all, almost done uh, by presenting you some numerical simulations, which was done by uh, Bourdin, Leon Baldelli, and Baurini on this, uh, on this model, actually, on this uh, conjecture model. 
And um, so in brittle fracture, the idea to do, uh, to do numerics it is to, um, to introduce um, so-called phase field, phase field approximations, which consist in, uh, um, in replacing the, the jump set of the crack by a, a smooth function that is called alpha here, okay, which will take the value uh, zero in a small neighborhood uh, or uh, zero or one, I never remember. Um, one, sorry, one in a small neighborhood of the crack and zero outside. And it varies continuously. So this is a kind of phase field variable in the spirit of um, Allen can approximation of the perimeter, uh, Modica Mortola. This is, this is uh, the, the same type of idea. Okay, so uh, you can see here an energy uh, in the phase field variable alpha, uh, which is uh, similar to the Monica Mortola energy, if you, if you know that. Okay, and then you have a small parameter delta, which measures uh, the, 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 the width. Uh, of, of your interface. So you have now a diffuse interface and it measures the width of the, of the interface. So here we, 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 we need to introduce a major, another additional variable that I call chi, which represents the, the delamination variable. So it represents the characteristic function of the delamination set. Okay? So now you consider this, uh, this energy functional, J zero delta of U, which is the displacement as before, alpha, which is a phase field variable. So in, in uh, mechanics, they also call them call, call it damage because it can be uh, uh, assimilated to a damage model. So which represents the transverse cracks. And chi is a damage or phase field variable, if you want, which represents the delamination de sets. So we didn't prove that, but it's not difficult to, to prove by adapting uh, classical proofs that um, this functional, which is uh, sometimes called also ambrosio tortorelli functional, gamma converges when, de when delta tends to zero to the one I showed you here, okay? And uh, the point is that now to do numerics, it's much more convenient to do it on this because, uh, because the crack is replaced by a, by a function alpha uh, with an energy which is quite good to, uh, to, to simulate. And uh, so this is what they, what they did, so Bourdin, Leon Baldini, Maruini. And they did it actually for this uh, 401 number in the, uh, research building of Polytechnic. And this is what they get by doing a numerics. So uh, maybe I can do a zoom. So, uh, so for instance, you see that there, there is a particular pattern here uh, at the middle of the four which looks like a Y, uh, a, a triple junction, uh, a triple junction uh, singularity that, can, that is not exactly, but very similarly reproduced here, okay? And uh, you can also see that uh, the, 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 how to say, the, the places where the defects are present here, uh, here, here is captured by the numerical simulation. So they did a lot of other numerics uh, on, uh, on this type of models that I'm not presenting you because uh, I am not responsible of that. But this is just to say that it seems that uh, this, um, this, uh, this model, this a priori phenomenological model, which is expected to be derived from three-dimensional elasticity, from three-dimensional brittle fracture actually, uh, seems to, um, to, uh, to capture the right, uh, the right uh, Defects which are uh, which are uh, um, the, the right type of defects, so transverse cracks and planar cracks, which are uh, present in this type of uh, of, uh, of asymptotic analysis uh, problems. Okay, so uh, I think uh, so. Of course, I'm not going to enter into details of the proof because I I am aware that this was already quite uh, technical because of notations and the quantity of information. So uh, I'm not going to go further into the details. And uh, okay, I stop you and I thank you for your attention. Very nice talk. Uh, do we have questions or comments?
Uh, everyone has the right to unmute. Feel free to fire them off. Um, okay, I'll get the ball rolling. I have, a, I think, a, a very naive question. Um, so in, in the beginning, when there was still the E sub zero, the sort of um, source of external strain floating around, um, yeah. I was sort of, my, my impression was that um, sort of this was, th that strain was the thing that was really driving the formation of the cracks in the four yes, one. Yes, it is uh, right. the lobbying. Yes, it is the lobbying. So, yeah, so so and, and this is presumably caused by sort of temperature variations due to the the sun. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how do I see something like that in in the very last slide when you're looking at the ah uh, because the, uh, okay I didn't uh, write it explicitly because you know usually when you prove gamma convergence results um, uh, if you have for instance forces or lower order terms or boundary condition. Uh, at the first stage, you don't include them in your analysis. You do the, the gamma convergence, and then uh, you check that you can put them uh, in the analysis without without modifying that much the, the result. So this okay. is exactly the same here. So we do first the, the gamma convergence analysis without e not without u not. Okay, so u not with the displacement in the in the in the, in the substrate, and then uh, using the fact that so we have done. Uh, Assumption on purpose is that the loadings are planar, so the, the, the strain is planar and the, the, the displacement as well. So it will imply that it will not modify at all the gamma convergence results in the sense that in the limit, you will end up with uh, instead of having so uh, here, it, so in this energy here, it will not be present. So you, you just need to add it. Uh, here, so you will have to remove E0 uh, alpha alpha here, here as well, minus E0 beta beta. Actually, every, everywhere where you have a E of U bar, you replace it by E of U bar minus E0, essentially. That's I it. See. Gotcha. There is no additional difficulty to, to, uh, to put them in the um, in the gamma convergence analysis, because it it's actually a lower order term in some in some sense. But it's true that from the point of view of the minimization, it's very important to include them. Otherwise, you have a, a trivial uh, minimization problem. You have essentially no uh, uh, no constraints. So here it gives you constraints, which gives which makes the, the minimization problem non-trivial. Uh, but from the point of view of the analysis. It doesn't create additional difficulties. Difficulty. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Just go ahead. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, Jean, very, very interesting. I, I'm wondering if you looked at the uh, surface instabilities associated with this uh, pre strain. So, coming to Ian's point, the, the epsilon naught, that's essentially induced by epitaxy when you drop one film on top of another and there's yeah. a lattice mismatch. So that basically dials in this pre-strain from the, the substrate. So I, I, we didn't do that, but I am aware of a recent paper by, um, uh, by uh, Manuel Friedrich and uh, Vito Chris Malé. I think they studied uh, this kind of model of uh, Epitaxy. Uh, uh, yes, actually. Yeah, so, 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 so the thing, I, yeah, the uh, thing I was wondering. I, yeah, yeah. I was wondering just to, to come to a point. There's there's different types of instability. So debonding is one. Yeah. But there's also a morphological instability. So yeah. if you allow mass transport on the surface, mm -hmm. then under a sufficiently large strain with a sufficiently thick yeah. film you'll end up with an instability in the surface. I was in some sense wondering about the competition between the mechanisms of energy release, debonding versus uh, surface relaxation. Yeah, so we, we didn't do that, but there are a lot of works in this, uh, in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one I think uh, being of by Bonti and Chambol, and uh, I think Irene also did a lot of things. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, I just have, have some memory of that too. Both, yeah. uh, uh, Giovanni, um, and I am aware of a very recent result uh, by uh, 
by um, Chris Malley and Friedrich, who did this kind of analysis also in a vectorial setting, which causes also mm -hmm. additional mathematical difficulties. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I'm not the right. Uh, oh yeah, no, just just to, 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 just to have curiosity. Have curiosity. But uh, yeah. there are many works on that, mm -hmm. but we didn't do that. Uh, Jean Francois. Yeah. Uh, question about in the energy. So you penalize the length of the crack, or I mean, maybe more especially. Is it clear that you would want kappa to be just a constant outside of the integrals? Or would you not, why not having something that would uh, say penalize the bending of the cracks? So maybe a surface tension, uh, ah, you can, you can, the uh, curvature or something like this. Is so it more uh, natural to just get the length? Uh, so you could add um, more difficult energy. So you could add, for instance, we didn't do, we didn't do that, but uh, you could add energies which depend on x and possibly on the normal uh, to the crack, okay? But more than that uh, becomes very difficult because uh, the point is that cracks uh, of uh, such function are uh, smooth, but not that smooth. So you should be, so you, if they are smooth enough in such a way that you can define a normal, but they are in general not so smooth that you can define the curvature. So it would require to consider uh, a subclass of displacement with uh, more regular jump sets. Uh, and in general, uh, so, so I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, because so, here you're something, really something depending on the normal is possible, but something depending on the curvature, I think it should be very difficult. Because here you're basically just working with sets of finite perimeter, right? So. The normal is well defined, but beyond that. Yes, yeah, this is a point. So uh, in mathematical terms, so the, the, the jump set of an SBD function is a rectifiable set. Right. Like the boundary of a set of finite perimeter, if you want. And you can well define a, a normal on the, on the boundary or, or on, the, on, the, on the rectifiable set. But in general, the, curva um, the curvature or even a, a, uh, second fundamental form is not uh, is not well defined, so you have to consider a subclass, and it becomes I think it becomes very uh, it becomes a geometric measure theory, pure geometric measure theory at this stage. Uh, so it is much more difficult. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, one last uh, chance. Anybody have anything else? Okay, great. Well, let's uh, thank Jean Francois again. Welcome. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you for coming. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, next week we have our final talk of the series um, with uh, Cyril Muratov. Um, so see you all then.